Good morning, it's so good to be together. I feel a special kindred spirit with students who studied abroad or were on hunger last semester. I wasn't far, but I was gone. I was on maternity leave um, at home for all of semester with my newborn. So I'm glad to be back and to be worshiping with you this morning. A few weeks ago, I was a bridesmaid in my brother-in-law's wedding. If you've ever been part of a wedding, you know there is a lot of rigmarole that goes into planning the big day. Then, the day of the wedding, all of the planning is set into motion. The morning of this wedding, we started getting ready hours before the ceremony. As things unfolded, I started to fret about my hair. It just, it just didn't look right. Then when I put on my dress, no amount of pulling or pinning could make it look right. And as someone who I don't wear a lot of makeup, I worried that I looked like a clown with all the blush and the mascara and lipstick on my face. I rushed to check myself in the mirror one last time before the ceremony, and a fellow bridesmaid pulled me aside. She told me something I desperately needed to hear. She said, Rebecca, this isn't about you. No one is gonna be looking at you. It's not about you. This harsh but true reprimand was exactly what I needed. She was right. It wasn't about me. And after that, I was able to enjoy the day, forgetting myself more and more, focusing on why we all had gathered in the first place. I have the same message for us this morning. Psalm 93, is not about you. In the five verses that make up Psalm 93, there is no reference to you or me. Because Psalm 93 has no reference to us, it makes it a pretty easy psalm for us to tune out. As we hear it, our eyes glaze over, we skip through it, go on to the next psalm. Almost every other psalm has a reference to God's people, but not Psalm 93. Psalm 93 is devastatingly not about us. And that's devastating because I love when the Bible or anything really is about me. These are the verses that are on our cell phone backgrounds or hung on our dorm room mirrors. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Or 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you. But Psalm 93, doesn't have any of this language. Why is this such a big deal? Why is this random lady in chapel who is often confused for a student making such a thing about Psalm 93 not being about us? Acknowledging what Psalm 93 is not about because it's so important, the lens that we bring to our Bible reading is so different than the cultural landscape where this Psalm comes from. If I'm ridiculous enough to make someone else's wedding about me, I need the same course correction in my Bible reading. Our culture's reference point for anything and everything is you. Atomistic, individualistic. What is the anthem of this cultural moment? You do you. And this question, a question as a counselor I ask every hour, every day. How do you feel about that? These place us at the center of everything. The author of this psalm, however, wrote with a God-centered worldview. The ancient cosmological maps show us that God is over everything, in everything, through everything. God is reigning in the heaven of heavens. God is sustaining the waters. God is holding together the earth. God is Lord even of the great deep. The psalmist wasn't asked for his opinion about God. He was filled with the spirit to pen words of life about God from God. Please, before you tune me out, Before you assume this is another message about millennials or Gen Z or whoever you are out there are too self-centered. We are all too self-centered. Psalm 93 is so much more interesting than a generational power trip. 
God doesn't give us Psalm 93 to say, gotcha, to make us feel guilty and embarrassed for looking to find ourselves in his word. He gives us Psalm 93 because he loves us. The same God who gave us Psalm 23, he leads me, he guides me. The same God gave us Psalm 93, the Lord reigns. So let's look closely at this Psalm that is not about us. Will you pray with me? God, we confess our impulse to make things about ourselves that bent in our heart to turn inward, to curve away from community, and most of all, you. Lord, thank you for the gift of this psalm, for inviting us out of that. We seek your Holy Spirit to guide us this morning, to prompt us, help us respond. Amen. Psalm 93 is not about you because it is for you. Three stanzas describe God's stability. Each stanza sets the scene. First, God is king. Second, God has dominion. And third, God is our home. I'm gonna read verses one and two. The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed, he is put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. God is king. In a song about God's stability, reigning from everlasting is a strong start. Nothing compares with God's eternal kingship. If you've grown up in the United States, you're accustomed to the government changing administrations regularly. In Psalm 93, we praise God that he is enthroned, established, everlasting never switching himself out for a new government. The phrase, you are from everlasting, anchors this stanza. When I was an undergrad at Wheaton, I took Philosophy 101. Let me pause and say, I took Philosophy 101, meaning I was physically present in the classroom. I didn't say that I aced philosophy, and I definitely cannot speak authoritatively about philosophy. That's never stopped me before. In philosophy, we studied proofs for God's existence. The ancient philosophers used these as they tried to understand space and time, heaven and earth. One stood out to me as beautiful and compelling. Aristotle and later Thomas Aquinas explore the concept of the unmoved mover, meaning there is a being who is unmoved, who initiates the movement of everything else. This being exists outside of time and space. Maybe this is what it means to be from everlasting, the unmoved mover. Also while at Wheaton, I spent a summer in Rapid City, South Dakota at the Wheaton College Science Station. It was the only way I could have passed my science credits. Are you catching my other theme here, hobbling through my academics at Wheaton? We spent hours discussing rock structures, the age of the earth, we studied old earth and young earth theories, something our professors always brought us back to. God is from everlasting. We do not debate the date of God's days. God's existence is not linear. It does not expire. God is, has been, and will forever be. God is king. This is our first picture. The next picture in verses three and four. The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring, mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. God has dominion. The psalm that is not about us continues in the second stanza with powerful imagery of God's dominion over creation. The water represents chaos, evil, anything opposing God's enthronement. Three times the psalmist writes of the threatening floods, lifting up their voice, roaring against creation's order. This repetition mimics the waves crashing against the shore. And three times the psalmist describes God's unmoving stability in the midst of the flood, mightier than the waves of the sea, mightier than anything 
evil, chaos, or destruction. The chaos of the water is demonstrated throughout the Bible. God's people sustain consistent assault from the waters. The chorus of worshipers singing Psalm 93 knew the truth of these words. The Lord is the only God who has power over the waters. So it isn't a surprise when Jesus is on earth, the waters rise up against him. In the Gospels, Jesus calms the Sea of Galilee. Do you remember this story? Jesus and the disciples are heading across the sea. As they sail, an epic, life-threatening storm stirs up against them. The disciples are seasoned fishermen accustomed to rough water. They're anxious, trying to keep the boat from sinking. Meanwhile, Jesus naps in the back of the boat. In a last-ditch effort to survive the storm, the disciples prod Jesus awake. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Peace. Be still, Jesus commands. The wind ceases. I have a confession. Even though I've heard, I also am having issues with my microphone. <laughs> Even though I've heard the gospel account where Jesus calms the Sea of Galilee many times, I didn't understand what the big deal was until I read Psalm 93. The trouble is, I've been taught, don't be afraid. Jesus is going to calm the storm. We even have a song about this. With Jesus in the boat, we can smile at the storm. I'll spare you. <laughs> you were worried. <laughs> but it doesn't make sense because Jesus doesn't calm every storm every time. Shipwreck, casualties at sea, that was business for the disciples. They lost friends to these storms. Loss, chaos, they're reality for our lives too. Financial insecurity, harassment, violence, our families breaking apart, the death of loved ones. You feel powerless and helpless. Your life moves dangerously around you. You aren't smiling in the midst of these storms. There's something bigger, more interesting going on when Jesus calms the sea. And Psalm 93 brings the clarity we need. Rather than a promise, everything's gonna be okay. Psalm 93 in this account reveal and confirm who Jesus is. When Jesus commands, be still. He is speaking as the God of the universe, the one everlasting in the throne room. Sally Lloyd-Jones offers a retelling of this account for children. She writes, the wind and the waves recognized Jesus' voice. They had heard it before, of course. It was the same voice that made them in the very beginning. They listened to Jesus and did what he said. As the thunder, the lightning, the crashing waves stop, the disciples ask the only logical question, who is this? No, really, who is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. The disciples have sung Psalm 93. They know only the Lord of Psalm 93 has power over the water. The man in front of them just did what Psalm 93 told them about. They start to put two and two together, but all they can say, who is this? Standing before them is God enthroned on high, the God from everlasting. Three pictures of God's stability. First, God is king. Second, God has dominion. And let's read the final stanza of Psalm 93. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. We have reached the climax. God's decrees are sure. Because God is forever enthroned, because God has dominion, what God decrees, what he states, what he warns, what he commands and promises, this is sure. A psalm that is not about us becomes intimately for us. This is an invitation. 
God who reigns, who conquers evil, is God who speaks promises for you. Trust him. Learn his promises in scripture. Build your home in his holy house. Today I said the psalm uses three pictures to describe God's stability. But these are not merely pictures. They are not just metaphors to get our creative juices flowing. They're reality, as real as the floor beneath our feet and the heartbeat inside our chest. God forever on his throne is reality. God is reigning eternally in the throne room. Before the foundations of the earth, he wasn't wandering around in some dark matter looking for something to do. God is reigning. God forever on the throne is reality. While the nations rage, the governments rise and fall, he is reigning. We tend to think the chaos of our time is reality. There is an even greater reality. God forever on his throne is reality. And don't succumb to the temptation to believe this is a distant and a passive enthronement. The God who repeals the floods he is concerned with your life. This is our greater reality, the reality that holds together the chaos we sense each day. I say this this morning with confidence, but not with ease. It's challenging to see God enthroned in my day-to-day -day life. About six months ago, my day started abruptly. My husband shook me awake, it's mom. We've gotta go, we've gotta get home. She's in the hospital. My husband's mom may be my mother-in-law by title. She was a mom to me. We joked we had the mother-daughter relationship without the baggage. <laughs> <coughs> a few hours later, I got the call. The doctors did everything they could. She had died. I was seven months pregnant with her first grandchild separated from my husband in a hectic airport, airport because we were only able to get on separate flights home. I was surrounded by people uninterested in my grief. The floods were rising. This storm was raging. My flight ended up being delayed and I never got to say goodbye to her. How can I sing about God's everlasting enthronement, knowing my son will never meet his grandma? How can I trust God's promises when he did not spare the life of a woman who walked with him faithfully? Death is your reality. Chaos is your normal. You wake up every morning unable to avoid this. But we have an even greater reality. In a moment, we are going to sing of God's throne room. We sing because this is the greatest reality. We sing because this is our sure promise. My mother-in-law is worshiping in this throne room. Someday, you and I will be worshiping at the feet of Jesus. We sing about the assault of the flood, the mighty hand of God stilling the storm because Jesus is God. Jesus commands nature. Jesus defeats death through his resurrection. Death is not your only reality. So we will sing right now of his salvation. This is your greatest reality. These are your sure promises. Psalm 93 is not about you because it is for you. For you to sing confidently back to God, for you to know who Jesus is, for you to cling to in the midst of the storm, for you to sing of the greatest reality. <laughs> 